So our next guest uh, this evening is uh, Brian Wiegand. And Brian has been quietly building and selling companies in Madison, Wisconsin for about uh, 20 years. He has a phenomenal track record. Like I mentioned before, he sold a company uh, to Microsoft right here out of Madison. And he also, at one point along the way, was uh, apparently the uh, 107th best poker player in the world. Pretty smart person. So please join me in welcoming Brian to the stage. Thanks, John. Thank you. What do you think so far? It's pretty good. Pretty good turnout. Absolutely. Right. So, how did you become started as an entrepreneur? How did I get started? I mean, I, I, I really had, I'm from Rhinelander originally up in northern Wisconsin, and I, you know, Rhinelander, there's not very tall buildings up there, so I had some big dreams to get out of Wisconsin, head to New York, uh, New York City. I wanted to get into investment banking, and I had all these big dreams. And, um, and that was where I was going. I was heading down that path. Um, and after I went uh, to school here at the UW, I went out, uh, um, out to New York City and took a job for a pre-IPO company. And uh, it was going really well, right? I mean, it's exciting, a pre-IPO company. I'm right outside of New York City. It's in the finance area. I was really excited. I was so excited that I, you know, I kind of noticed I had like a really desire to just kind of be an entrepreneur, even inside this small company. So I just kept pushing this new department, this new idea inside this company. And just like um, uh, you know, one of the previous speakers, she got fired. I got fired as well, pushing a little too hard. And after that, um, you know, kind of collecting unemployment, sitting outside of New York City, getting fired off my career path was really a big step for me to really try something different. And that's when um, I decided to kind of start a company. That's it put me on that track. And this company, Edyne, am I correct? Yeah. Is this, how did you come up with the idea for this? So remember, I, I'm, I'm an old man now, and Edyne was like, I think, the same year that Amazon was founded. The domain name, uh, Amazon.com, was registered right at this time. So the internet is really in its infancy here. And so I was outside of New York City. I thought, you know, back in, you know, I think this is in like 1997 or 1998, I thought, well, why don't I put every restaurant in New York City on the internet? That was like a cool idea in 98 or 99. And so I went door to door in restaurants, and I'm like, God, this is a lot of work. And so I needed to incorporate this business called Edine. And um, so I contacted a lawyer, and I'm like, God, $2,000 to incorporate. There's got to be a lot of companies starting up right now on the internet. And so I thought, God, it would be better to have sit it behind a desk or a computer than going door to door in restaurants. So I created a company to help businesses incorporate. And so that was Biz Filings, and that was kind of one of those classic bootstrap, no money in, sitting at the, your desk, and, and, uh, and so we grew that. We were incorporating about 100 companies a day and grew, grew it pretty quickly. And uh, you were in New York at the time? In New York, yeah. So how do we end up back in Madison? <laughs> you can't do this kind of thing now, but I mean, this kind of shows you how far we've come in terms of from a technology perspective. <laughs> so I literally, you know, the, today you kind of have you know, cloud-based computing or whatever. So my server was my computer at the time, and, and so I was hosting the website right out of my computer, and, and I did all that kind of HTML was just really cool back then, the internet was just starting. So I'm in New York, my family wanted to move back to Madison. I was excited about it too, so I have this website, it's on my computer, and there's no cloud computing back then, so I literally said, all right, let's do this. Let's unplug the computer, we'll hop in the car, drive to Madison, and plug it back in as fast as I could so we don't lose any much business on the website. <laughs> you just don't do it that way anymore, but that's how I got back to Madison. Um, and uh, we didn't lose too much. <laughs> was that sort of a hectic drive back? Where, like, yeah, it was. I got a speeding ticket as well. So <laughs> I was like, the server's in the back. <laughs> they didn't right? Okay. And so you're back in Madison, and what happens next? So loving being back in Madison, obviously. Um, it's uh, just being back in Wisconsin is great. Um, business violence was growing. Um, and then, you know, um, I decided to start another business while business violence was going on. And then business violence sold. Um, so that kind of like started off with nothing and sell it for around 13 or 14 million. It was a big change in my life. And then I start, like I said, I started another one, um, partnered with uh, some other people, Mark McGuire, started Name Protect, um, which is a uh, a company to police to crawl the internet and try to find uh, abuses or trademark infringements on the internet, um, and then sold that. Um, and I can keep going if you like. Um, 
started another company, a jellyfish. Uh, so I was those first two, if you think about business filings and name protect, were very B2B businesses, right? So my client was another business. And so I, I, I was a little, you know, you see all these cool companies, all these neat new companies that are more B2C uh, businesses that where you could be a lot of scale work individual users. And so I thought, let me jump over to that arena. And so we started uh, jellyfish.com. And that was scary because I wrote a $25,000 check for the domain name jellyfish.com. And uh, uh, that was my wife. I thought that was going to be a divorce situation. But um, so I went with that. It really turned out well. And we sold that to Microsoft. And that was a more of a direct to consumer model um, and more of a shopping search engine at the time. So that worked out pretty well. So these first three companies, the idea for the first one kind of came out of a situation where you had the problem, tried to solve it, and realized that there was potentially business opportunity, right? Yes. How about the other two? So in terms of trying to solve an individual problem versus... How did you come up with the idea for the other oh, two? Oh, the other ones, yeah. I mean, again, coming off of selling business filings and then selling name protect, and so I was, you know, each one was getting a little bigger, so like a, a $14 million sale, or, a $22 million sale, and then Jellyfish was a $50 million sale. And you're feeling really good at that point, right? As an entrepreneur, you're feeling, this is great. And so admittedly, I, I'm, I'll get to the answer, but I just, admittedly, I was really cocky, right? I mean, oh my God, let's just start these things up and sell them. This is really easy. Um, and so um, you get a little sloppy, you have a little bit more money. And so when I was coming up with the idea for the next one, which was, my biggest failure actually after that was Alice.com. Um, you know, the idea was more of, through less discipline than I would say that I had in other, other startups. And so the other one was more of going through a more of a traditional investment process, what to start, what to start. The first one, of course, I just stumbled upon, but the other ones were more disciplined and, and approaching it, just as an investor, because I'm investing my life, I'm investing my own money. It's, as opposed to, I just have this idea, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to make it happen, whatever happens. It's more of just, you're investing in it, so you take more of a disciplined approach. So Alice was more out of a, the need of trying to bring consumer packaged goods and be able to, I mean, this was, again, a little early. I think that Jet sold for billions of dollars. Alice was a very similar model where trying to take the uh, center store or CPG or consumer goods and put them online. Toilet paper and toothpaste delivered free shipping. Did that before it was all the big money and all the good successes. So I failed, we raised the most money, and that was my first failure after three successes. The, the fourth one was the first? The fourth one, yeah. Failure, okay. Yeah, and let's back up a step though and talk about the, the jellyfish uh, sale. So I've got in my mind my vision of what it's like to sell company to Microsoft. I imagine they're kind of showing up there like a bunch of suits or something like that, and then they're reaching out to you and then trying to buy this company. What did, it, what did the process look like? You know what's funny, I, first of all, uh, Everyone at Microsoft I met is unbelievably super smart, really well accomplished, but they all look the same. I mean, they all have the same look, every one of them. And about nine of them came into the office. Um, and um, it was exciting, obviously, when, when, when Microsoft calls, you think it's a joke or a, a, a spam email or something, and someone, I'm from, uh, from uh, M&A, from Microsoft, and I'm interested, in, or Corp Dev, and I'm trying to, interested in buying your company. So you don't really believe that at first. We were only 18 months in from the start um, when we got that email. So it was a little surreal, but the process was, you know, I learned a ton, right? Selling other companies and going through that due diligence process of, of, of the process of selling the company. So you really set the company up in a way so that's in the hope of getting liquidity and selling. So by doing that, it's a lot smoother. So Microsoft was actually really impressed. I think we were pretty organized through that process. But then working at Microsoft was awful. I mean, I, you know, as an entrepreneur, then going to a company with 80,000 people, I, that was a depressing time. Okay. And then... Um, not, though, but it's just not very fun. Okay. And now we're on to Hopster. Yep. Well, no. Uh, yeah. Well, so after Alice failed, um, so again, this violence success, name protect success, jellyfish success, and then Alice was a failure. And then coming out of Alice was, a, you know, so there you're really down. <laughs> Um, and, and so that re, re, uh, um, leveled me in terms of, uh, of the approach and discipline. So I started Hopster, which was a, a company to bring, uh, bring coupons onto the internet, the Sunday paper, and get rid of the Sunday circular and started that business. Okay. So let's go back to Alice for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that one didn't go so well. Can you kind of talk us through like, like what that was like and how you kind of navigated that process when you realized things weren't going? Yeah. You said before that you felt like, in retrospect, you got a little sloppy, but... 
Can you talk us through that? Yeah, I mean, I think just being cocky, um, that discipline that I had in the other businesses, the approach of really treating it from an investment perspective. You know, check off the 10 boxes. If I was going to write a, a big check into this company, what things would I look at? And I think that's what, I, I think some entrepreneurs don't go do that approach as an investor. They're looking at it through a passion. You got to have the passion. But I, I got a little sloppy on that. I didn't check all 10 boxes that I like to check before I would start a business. And so we ended up just, it was all passion and admittedly some cockiness, like I said, plowed ahead. And I actually ended up raising the most amount of capital. We raised over 30, or about 20, almost $30 million and, and that failed. And so a lot of learnings there, a lot of humbling learnings, but um, it, I really feel it was a lack of discipline. It was fun. Um, it was an exciting ride, um, but it, it was so close, though. I, mean, I don't know if you know this, but actually, Target put an offer in um, right before for fifty million to buy it, um, right before we shut down, and, and the deal did not go through. And it's very hard to raise money after a deal doesn't go through like that. And so you, like we talked about this earlier, one of the things you shared with me is that you know it wasn't the most easy thing to do to, to kind of bounce back from that. But one of the things you shared with me is that you said that which a quote really resonated with me is that. Uh, you said fear of failure is is the death knell for an entrepreneur. And so how did you go from that company that didn't do so well to then getting yourself back in the game where you kind of were able to shed the, the fear of failure? Yeah, and you're absolutely right, right? I mean, when you, when, the, when you go forward and if you're thinking about failure, failure is part of the process. I mean, that's part of being an entrepreneur, part of being a startup. And, and when that creeps into your head, I wonder if this is going to work. I, I, is this going to really, and sure, you have your doubts, and one minute you think you're a billionaire, and one minute you think you're bankrupt. That kind of feeling is still there always. But there's a difference between that feeling that could shift on a second-by-second -second basis to feeling that you're going to fail. And after raising $30 million, and I've, I've made all this money for all these different investors, um, and then to take $30 million and not return anything back, is and then you just question yourself, you question everything, and it, we've all had failures, right? I mean, it, but then to come back from that to your point and to kind of go back to my roots of, from an entrepreneurial perspective and build back up and still continue to move forward without that failure in your head is tough. So it took a little time, but I mean, you know, getting back to um, what I what I originally was doing in the first companies really helped. Getting back to discipline, looking at what you know. So it sounds like to me in your head, you kind of sort of have this, this kind of checklist. You kind of mentioned it before where I, you know, I, when I started, you know, that one company didn't do so well, there was this checklist and maybe in retrospect, I look at it and I didn't, maybe I didn't check all the boxes. So what are some of the things that you're looking for when you're vetting an idea for yourself that you, makes you kind of conclude like this is one that's going to be worth my time and, and maybe this one is not? Yeah, and these are, are very cliche. I mean, I think if you talk to a venture capitalist or an investor, you'd hear some of the similar things, but for me, you know, particularly we have to realize we're in Wisconsin. So is this a business that I can grow and build in Wisconsin? Um, that's an early quick one. Two, is it, you know, it, what's your competitive advantage? That's a basic, you know, solid business school term, but it's really important. And not that, and again, when I say competitive advantage, it's really, this is really, I, I'm really passionate about this because every business I've ever done, you could copy in two weeks with a, you know, five developers and do it better. So competitive advantage doesn't mean I have a super cool vitamin D compound and I got 10 patents and that's not what I mean. That's obviously an unbelievable competitive advantage, but I mean a marketplace execution competitive advantage in the internet. I mean, I, we could, I bet we could get five people in here and we could whip up Twitter in a few minutes. So what's Twitter's competitive advantage? I mean, we can talk. So that, to me, I have to look at that and, and, and what is that competitive advantage? Not from the traditional, I have a patent and defensibility. In the internet space, it's a little bit different. It's an executionable, execution competitive advantage. So can I raise the money? Do we have the talent? Um, can I get a management team um, together to be able to, uh, to, to do this type of business? Is it a heavy tech business? Is it a very market? You know, what, depending on what it is. So you're going through all those check boxes, very similar to what a, uh, an investor would do. And then what are the, what are the milestones? What can, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? And setting those metrics and feeling really good about it. And then finally, after all of that, are you really passionate about it to go to the war and just battle this out and take it to the end? And, and, and that, if you have that plus those boxes, it's a goal for me. So like many entrepreneurs go down this path where they might have like one exit or, or surprisingly maybe even two, which is very rare. 
And then they kind of shift gears. They become like an investor or whatever, kind of more of an advisor, and they're kind of not back in the weeds again. And you kind of keep going back, right? You mm -hmm. start up with another idea, and then you pursue it. Why are you doing that? Yeah, I mean, so Hopster sold, so I had a success after the failure, and then now I'm on to another one, Gravy. Um, and I look, I really tried, right, after doing this and, and, and having four successful exits and one failure and getting older, um, I really thought and really took a, a, a reflection. I'm like, well, you know, why not move more into the investor seat? Why not um, uh, take some other type of maybe a mentoring, another type of job? And I really, and, and every time I went down that path, I just ended up back with just the roots of, of, of being able to take an idea and from zero and manufacture market cap and create value by a disruptive concept or idea. That to me just just feeds me, and so and I kept coming back. It was magnetic back to that. So I tried everything I could to not do a startup for the um, for for number five, and um, but I, I just love it. I'm glad I'm back. But it's also harder as a 25 year old now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, you've got a fantastic record building companies here in, in, in Wisconsin and in Madison area. Can you talk about like some of the pros, like why this is a great place to do business and why you're still here and then maybe some of the challenges that you face as an entrepreneur operating in this environment? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love the area. I think it's, it, it's a great place from a family and lifestyle standpoint. And, um, and I remember, and again, just the kind of a story, I remember just a quick thought, I just deviated in my head. I remember early days back when I started, I would be on my back deck I never liked to go out my back deck. It was a tighter neighborhood, and I, I and back then I'd come out and maybe do a little grilling, and then a deck person, another one over there. That's that dot com guy. You know, that was how like startups were viewed back then, and so it was very challenging to try to convince someone to leave an American family or a a, a Land's End to come on board to a startup. That's like crazy. And so, so one, that's really changed in a really, 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 really positive way. Now it's it's. Almost everyone you know is done, related, invested, been part, or something related to a startup. So, and and that's that transition has really helped in terms of recruiting, getting talent, um, and the tech talent is really uh, much better than it was back then. Um, it's still really hard to get some areas, and then the market's so great here. It's so hard you have to really pry someone out of another opportunity, um, and so, but that. What I like about it, though, is we're real, realistically, I mean, if you think about it compared to a Silicon Valley in terms of rent, pay, and all those types of things, it's really great to be able to put a company here. The investment side, I feel like uh, there's a tremendous amount of seed capital. I mean, I, I've raised over $100 million of largely seed capital, a few professional investors. Um, along the way. And so I think Madison's really good from that. There's tons of money, tons of seed money, tons of funds. So where the problem I have and I feel, and I, I know I'm jumping a little bit off topic, but in terms of starting a business here, the challenge is, is we, I think we are starting to get better from that next level, that A round investment, a growth round. There's not a lot of capital here for businesses like the ones I've started. It's 10, you know, there's not a lot of investors I talk to in this area that might have, of the one or two that might have a fund that can fund a, a business like this, it's an internet business, this type of business, not in Madison. You just, it's just hard to raise that money. You have to go east and west to do that. So that's a challenge still here in the town. But in terms of finding employees, finding tech people, in terms of costs, you can really do a lot with a company here. And, and there's so many resources. So you use some terminology in, in, in what you're talking. You mentioned the seed investment, and you mentioned like a round, I believe. Can you talk us through what those things are? Yeah, so that's a good point. So the seed investment is that first money, that that friends and family money to slightly into even a professional uh, fund that might be that first money that comes in, seeding the company. Um, and then after you do that, then you typically get into the more professional venture capital rounds. Um, and I think that those are the any other, I mean, private equity. We have uh, Zamp obviously has private equity funding. I have not. I have always sold before I get to those levels. I'd love to have six hundred and fifty employees. That's impressive. Um, but I, I always sell before that. So if students here in, in the room, they're sitting and they're saying like, "Hey, I want to learn what it's like to, to be more like Brian." You, know, you were an economics major when you were here, and then you went on uh, and, and moved to New York and started these different companies. What does a typical day look like for you now? 
So I'm, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a, 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 you know, strange person from some different philosophies I have, the way I run my day. I don't believe in meetings. You, there's no calendar in our office or any of our people. That's for external. Obviously, if like if one of you wanted to meet with me, I'd put that on the calendar. But we in, in the office, I never, I don't believe in meetings. Uh, I, and it started from being in Microsoft, and it was like, uh, you know, it was just be blocks of every day. It was just, it was just, and, and so it really, I, I, as soon as I got rid of meetings, it really opened up our productivity. And be able to, when you have something you need to do, you meet on it. If there's not something to do, you don't meet, and it really works. Obviously, that breaks down when you get over 40, 50 employees. Um, but so that's one philosophy. I, I really another thing that I do is it's clearly and one of the things if you're thinking about starting a business, key thing is founders or partners. It's so critical. I really don't do anything in these companies. All I do is build a team and help them be successful. So I don't really sit in my office or do much. Um, I just walk around. I literally my day is I walk around from the person that runs that department. How's it going? Need any help? Answer any questions? Help on vision? And by talking to everyone and walking around, I literally, it's not literally like I walk around in a circle, but you just walk and make sure that that person is able to execute their job. And it's amazing how everyone stays on point from a vision and moves forward, no meetings. And I walk around and talk. So it's a little strange types of philosophies that, that I've built up over time that have been really good for my system. I, so good, good co-founders, it's critical, especially if you're not a tech person. You need to have a good solid tech co-founder in a business like the stuff that I do. So those are some of the things that I think are interesting about my day that are a little bit odd or strange that are interesting. And when you're walking around and like and tapping on these shoulders, what are you looking for? Are you looking to kind of coach people, trying to detect where the problems are? Like what's 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 going on in your head as you're as you're doing this? Yeah. So if you're talking to let's say it's your CTO, um, hey, I need a decision on this and this. You help them really quick with that decision. And so I'm owning the vision. Uh, I, I'm the expert on the market, the, the, the competitors, and where we want to go and make sure we're on point to that. And you're getting all this data in. I like to, it's a two-way street. I'm helping them, but they're also giving me data back from customers uh, um, and other types of constituents that affect. So I'm, it's a, and it's really me collecting data to adjust the vision, but then it's making sure that any decision that they need to make quickly, they don't have to wait for tomorrow's meeting at 10 o'clock. They get it answered right there. And by continuing to do that, it's amazing how productive everyone is in being able to solve their problems very quickly on the fly. And so it's a two-way, I'm collecting data though, because I, I would say, and I'm sorry if it's so long-winded, but now you got me fired up here. Um, it's that one of the things that's so cool about a startup that I love is the nimbleness of the early, early days of, so think about it, you start with an idea, and every idea I've started with is 500% different to what it is the time you get to the exit. And so I think one of the keys is, is that you have, Millions of points of data coming in every single day. So does Facebook and Google and everything else, but they're not nimble enough to take that data to move their giant machine. So as a startup, you, you're hearing something, you see a competitor, you talk to a customer, you talk to, all this data is coming in and millions of data points every day and the ability to change very quickly every single day to adjust that vision. I'm not talking solid right turns. I mean, that, that, those pivots like that would be a little aggressive, but taking that data and adjusting and moving that vision is an advantage that a startup has. If you don't do that, if you're stuck just on your vision and don't listen to that data, you're not taking advantage of that nimbleness of the startup. And that's been really key in, in, um, in just in gravy, six months old, and the pivots and the changes and the things that happen just through that path. It's amazing seeing how fast it happens. And I think that's key for a startup to be successful. And so how do you not bounce around too much? Or is this not the right way to think about it? Like often students come in my office and it's like, you know, one week they're doing one thing, next week they're doing another, and it's just like they're never zeroing down in a particular thing. Yeah, I mean, how the you... vision, it's usually you're trying to, to, to make a difference in the world with a solid vision statement that you're trying to do. I would say it's more of these pivots are more tactical than they are strategic, so it's not massive changes. Um, and so I'm, I'm probably overplaying that a bit, but... It's, I just think it's important to be able to listen to the market and react quickly. And, and, um, and so I don't, I mean, if, if you were a company that was changing, one minute we're doing this and one minute we're doing it, it'd be very tough to keep everyone aligned and excited about it. So it's just adjusting um, very quickly to react to that. It's not major right turns. Okay. So let's talk about the students for a little mm -hmm. bit. So one thing I see them grapple with a lot is this decision when they're about to graduate. And they've got this, this, this venture, this idea that they worked on a little bit, maybe a lot, 
And then you also have this job that's like staring them in the face that has all these wonderful benefits and everything else. How would you advise them to think through like which path to take? So, I mean, this is another area that I feel pretty strongly about is, is I talk to so many people that get enamored with a, a startup or the entrepreneur and they have an idea, they're excited. And they're, they're 40 or 45, they have kids and a mortgage. And from a student perspective, if you're out there right now and you are thinking about, and again, I, I'm probably, I'm not, I'm not trying to be anti, go and take a great job, but if you do have anything you want to do from an entrepreneur's perspective, don't do it when you have 17 kids and 15 mortgage, mortgage, that's not the time to do it. It's so hard, it's so risky, so difficult. And so at this time, so in that don't be afraid to fail, who cares, go for it, try it. You don't have a mortgage, you don't have 99 things that are, are weighing you down. Now's the time to go for it and, or, or, or try something, get fired like I did. I mean, whatever, I'm not saying get fired, please don't do that. But I mean, no, but this is the time now. I mean, if you're, if, this is the time to take the risk, this is the time to take the chances. And I, I just, I, I can't say it enough. If you have that, don't, you'll regret it if you don't go after it. This is the time. And, and there's so many resources, so many things available that allow you to get mentored and do these things to be able to get be successful. And so your mindset, like your story was, you're, you, know, you had this job, you got fired, then you started a company, and the first one didn't go so well, the Edine, and then you found the next one. So you had to go through two, basically, you know, rough events before you got, got going on, on the track. What about um, uh, looking for ideas? Like, what advice do you have for the students about how they should think about ideas and what they should be working on? So, and, and I'm curious your thoughts too, because you may disagree with me on this actually. I feel like ideas are a dime a dozen. I bet we could brainstorm right now if we did this and open, we could come up with 15 good ideas, 100 good ideas. I just think, so I did a business on incorporating businesses. That's a very heavily legal, or I didn't, I mean, I, I, mean, I probably would never ever say this, but I formed this business on incorporating a business. I never ever incorporated a business. I never knew how to incorporate a business when the first order came in. I didn't know a thing about it. But I'm starting a business, a heavy legal business on how to incorporate. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Um, I actually, because I, I was freaking out, I partnered with a law student that was graduating here um, to be a co-founder because I liked the domain expertise. But my point is, is I didn't have any knowledge or skills of that at all. And so I, and so I think that expertise, if you have that, um, so in creating an idea, there's a lot of them. So having that, uh, the ability, I guess I'm, I'm not being articulate, I apologize. Ideas are a dime a dozen. You can do anything. It's the execution that's good. You can learn anything very quickly. As long as it's not a very scientific, you know, like my back my vitamin D compound, that would take some very serious domain expertise. But on these other ones, you can acquire this knowledge very quickly. So I, I just think ideas, we can come up with a lot of them. It's really how you're gonna, how you're gonna execute and approach that. There's better ideas than worse, of course. So you're sort of a mindset more of, you know, choose something you enjoy working on, pursue that, see how it goes. If it doesn't work out, then maybe try something else again, but definitely do like something. Gotta have the passion, right? And I like, you know, if you have some, and that's the way to find ideas is obviously just look at where your passions are, where your excitements are, what you like to do, and ideas come out of that. That's always better because you can get that passion around it and pick up that, uh, if you already have an excitement around that area, it's a great place to get ideas. But you don't have to, I mean, you can come up with something and acquire the knowledge pretty quickly. I didn't know a thing about poker. I read 15 books, you know, and then I really wanted to be good at poker. And so I think you can do the same thing with businesses. So let's talk about financing for a minute. So Zach Helmstead did an amazing job of getting his company very far, bootstrapping before he raised uh, funding. But how do you, what advice do you have for students that are trying to build a company, have a high growth trajectory, and they're trying to go out and raise money to do that? What thoughts do you have? Yeah, I mean, the, the model's changing, right? You can do so much more with so little now. Um, you know, server cost 30,000 when I first started. Now you can take 30,000 and go a long ways with that. Um, so I, the key is, is to move, validate the idea as fast as possible with as little amount of uh, money. So the bootstrapping lean startup concept is all great. I, I, I completely um, understand how that, that works. So, so it's clearly not starting out with a giant, I need $2 million. You probably need $2 million for your business, but you don't have to start with that. Don't be worried about that. <laughs> worried about what I need to do to move this to the next level so I can get to that next level, and that, and that involves financing as well. So the least amount of money um, that gets you the furthest amount uh, that you can is really a key discipline. So 
even in myself, right? So I could you know raise thirty million in one business so in gravy. We started, which is a few hundred thousand dollars. Even though we could have raised millions, why raise millions when you want to make sure you're moving the business along and you can validate it with these different steps? So it's really important to not overfund. Don't worry about the big checks right now. Worry about moving this thing forward and getting some momentum. And in terms of like the specific like way to approach or like who to approach in Madison to ask, like what thoughts do you have on that as far as where good sources of financing might be for student startups? So, I mean, I, I think there's so many more resources now than there ever was. Obviously, there's some really great um, programs, WARF and the other types of programs that are in the university. And there's so many different seed funds that are coming around with the government putting out um, the fund of, Badger Fund of Funds. Um, and deploying that out all around the state. There's, there's a, a dozen seed funds around. Um, and then there's also, and again, even if you want to take one step before thinking about taking on investment, you're just starting. I mean, getting five or $10,000 from either from yourself or a friend or family is really good too. I mean, start off small, move it forward, make sure you're fully committed, and then go for it, put the pedal down from there. All right, so tell us what gravy is. What's the vision behind it and what are you trying to do? Um, I didn't want to promote it at all today. Um, um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, Gravy is, the idea is just quickly, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a new live streaming platform. It's a, for YouTube, Instagram creators or B-level celebrity, or any celebrity that way. I have an opportunity to use the internet as, a, um, as a, a live show. So it's a live streaming platform for you to have it. Actually, everyone knows what podcasting is. We're a live video podcast, an interactive live video podcast. So a podcast, you listen to it when you want. It's not live. This is live with video, interactive. The audience participates, can interact back and forth. Um, and, and the people that lead these shows are creators that um, generally have an audience. Um, like I said, we have like uh, someone that was on The Bachelor, someone that was on Housewives of New York. They host a show, or just a big-time YouTuber, or someone that has a big audience on Instagram. We give them, we've given them a platform to go live, but very interactive. So, like, when I've been to, on the platform, I see these folks that are making the shells, and they are very excited about about doing it, and they're very uh, engaging, also on the camera. How did you get them to come and work with you? And in the beginning, you just had like basically nothing. So, I mean, I, I just think there's a giant amount of white space between. I want to have the, the Kardashian show on E or whatever the channel it is. That there's only a few people that win that that type of a situation, right? So, um, and then all the way over here, you know, I can have an Instagram page, a YouTube page, and uh, and maybe make a little money with it, my uh, my YouTube videos that I put or a channel on YouTube. And so in between there, there's a lot of room. And so what we did is we are giving a platform for people that want to have a show like the Kardashians, but let's do it on the internet and make it interactive. Um, and uh, be able to participate and get a little bit more intimate. So if I have a YouTube channel, I just put out videos. I don't know who my, I don't know who's viewing it. I don't get to interact with them. There's a little comment box underneath. But imagine now, if you pick whoever you think that you really would love to meet or talk to, imagine being able to interact on the, on the web back and forth, almost like a real-time video chat, but in a, in a real show format. That's what we're doing. These people really got excited about it. We were able to get all this talent by getting a, a, a product that really played to their needs. They wanted to be able to get closer to their fans get, and to be able to make money. We really built a lot of cool into, or, uh, uh, monetization features to allow brands to come in. Instead of doing interrupted pre-roll commercials that interrupt you, why not make content that's actually branded content in these shows and allow the users to um, get involved with the show and help monetize as well. Fantastic. Do you have any like final parting thoughts for the, the audience, the students here that are thinking about entrepreneurship? I mean, and thank you, John. This has been excellent. Thank you for inviting me. Obviously, you are a tremendous resource. Um, I wish I would have known you when, when you were when I was in school here. Um, I think using people that that understand this area, I think, and getting a mentor and talking, asking questions, I think is key. Just and don't be afraid to fail. That's part of the whole process. It's funny because you know, I, I was really it was amazing trying to raise capital. I'll just wrap up with this. After I failed, it was like, it, it's different in cultures, right? In Silicon Valley, it's like, I, I failed here, I failed here, I failed here, I failed here. And you're just like, yeah. Over there. And here, I went out and I was failing. It's like a scarlet letter. Oh, I want to, you failed last time. I don't want to invest in you. Even though I had all these other sentences, it was very negative. Our, the culture here is very different. 
or failure is just not. So I think you've got to shake that. That's part of the entrepreneur is try, fail, try again. So go for it. Just go for it right now. Do it. Tonight, we'll get these ideas cooked up and attack. Brian, thank you very much. Thank you.